So thank you very much um, again for attending. Uh, just a brief overview, what makes us different, what makes us different than other programs in, in this area. We offer a multidisciplinary education. So our faculty, as you'll notice by looking at our page, are people who come from all kinds of academic disciplines. I'm a political scientist. There are anthropologists here. There, um, there are sociologists in, in the program. And so we come at international studies from an interdisciplinary uh, focus. We have leading scholars in this field who focus on a variety of different regions and, and topics. And I'm going to get to that in a second, which regions and topics that we covered. One of the, I think, the most particular things about this program is that it's an extremely small cohort. And so we have, I think, about a dozen uh, full-time tenure-track professors now here in our department. And our cohort is only a little bit larger than that. And so if you're admitted and you do this program, it's almost a one-to-one. -one. There's usually between 16 and 20 students in, in each cohort. So it's a very small cohort. You'll get to know each other very well. And you'll get to know the teachers very well. The teachers, the, the, the instructors, the faculty, such as myself, uh, are, I think, very accessible. And the class sizes are extremely small. So all the classes will be around that size. Um, the program is about 12, and, th and that's quite different. I, I did a program, a master's in international studies, decades ago, it seems like, centuries ago, and it was much larger. It was, it was hundreds of people, and so it's a very different experience if you have a small cohort like this with the kind of individualized attention that you get. Uh, the program is, is relatively short. Uh, you can usually the the courses in the program uh, are over a year and then afterwards you have to do your thesis and extended essays. And so most people take between a year and 24, 12 to 24 months to complete the, the program. But I think the average probably being someplace around 18 months is my guess. Um, the, the funding is also an exceptional, I think, in terms of master's programs, international studies, master's programs. Um, Everybody gets their entire tuition covered for, for one year. Um, and we can get more into the financing. I'm sure that's of interest to some afterwards. And Bridget will have, I think, better information than me on some of that. And then in addition to funding the tuition for the first year, the top students can get grants of up to $25,000, Canadian dollars, that is. Um, in addition, you know, most people take this program in order not to go into uh, the academy or to go on and do a PhD program, although there are, there are some of those. Um, most people, most students take this program to go on and, and have a career in something related to the field of international studies. And so we try to provide uh, professional development opportunities that are oriented towards this. And we're gonna talk about the co-op opportunity in, in a second. And that's really geared, people come and they have, they take classes, but they then also, are put in touch, they network, uh, and they get experiences that will help them in their career afterwards. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the presentation until the end, and then we'll field questions at the end. So I'm not going to be stopping to, to field questions in, the meet, in between. Um, the faculty, I mean, I would really suggest if you're interested in this program to take a close look at the faculty in this program. That will tell you the most about the kind of stuff that we do. You'll, these are the people you'll be working with uh, the most. Uh, the the um, continuing faculty that we also have adjunct faculty, but the, the core faculty of our program are the people that you see on this page. Um, I'll just go through their names uh, and say a little bit about what they do, because I think this is extremely important for people interested in this. In other words, if you're interested in something that our faculty do, don't do, it will be harder for you, I think, in this program. And, or in contrast, if you're really interested in something that we specialize in, this would be a great place for you. So uh, starting from the top left, uh, Tamar Mustafa uh, is a professor here. Uh, he just stepped down from being the director, actually, of, of the school. He specializes in legal studies, uh, especially um, in comparative perspective in Muslim countries, uh, with a specialization in Egypt and Malaysia. Uh, Megan McKenzie is currently the director of our school. She's to his right. She's a feminist scholar working on, um, working on, internet, on militaries. Uh, sexual violence and um, and conflict studies. Uh, Chris Gibson, who is the next uh, to Megan, the right, I guess on your on the slide, uh, is specializes in social movements in Latin America, in particular in Brazil, as well as public health care. He he wrote a book on understanding how health in Brazil was shaped by social movements from below. Um, 
Nicole Jackson uh, is to Chris's right. A professor in this program focuses on international security with a specialization in Central Asia. She's been working on Russia and Central Asia for decades now. Uh, Brenda Leishog, uh, to her right, is uh, a senior lecturer in our department um, and so spends a lot of her time teaching. She's the head of our undergraduate study program at the moment. Um, and she does a lot of work on political theory, but also on humanitarian intervention. And so that's, uh, that's her uh, and international security in general. And then on the bottom row, uh, Gerardo Otero is um, currently the director of graduate studies for our program. So somebody that our current master's students have a lot of interaction with. Uh, he is, specializes on um, social movements in Latin America, Mexico in particular, peasant movements in Mexico, uh, as well as, um, as, as, as nutrition and food. His most recent volume was the neoliberal diet. And so focusing on understanding the diet of countries in Latin America. Um, to Gerardo's uh, right on your screen is Irene Pang, who's an assistant professor in the program here with a focus on labor rights and labor studies in, in a comparative, comparative perspective, China and, and India. And there's a, a glam photo of myself there. As you can see, I look nothing like that. <laughs> uh, my work is, I'm an assistant professor here, and my work it focuses on conflict and social movements in Africa. Uh, especially the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, then to my right is Darren Byler, who joined us, seems like a while ago, but I think it's, he just joined us a year ago. Uh, and Darren does fantastic work on, um, on Xinjiang province, and he's one of the world's uh, renowned scholars uh, on, uh, on Xinjiang province. He's an anthropologist by training in China uh, and works on surveillance, uh, surveillance capitalism, and surveillance technologies with uh, a lot of other projects working on this elsewhere in Southeast Asia at the moment as well. And then finally, Liz Cooper on the bottom right is uh, a, a associate professor here um, working on uh, healthcare and education in, in migration with a focus on Kenya. So she does a lot of, uh, she and I are the people who work on Africa uh, in particular. So that's a very brief overview. Again, I encourage you uh, to take a closer look at our website. You can see greater detail about the stuff that we do. Um, how is our program structured? So usually you take two terms of full-time classes and coursework. And then there's a third term. And so that's the fall and the spring. Usually, typically you'll start here, application deadlines, I'll get to them, but applications usually are submitted in the winter uh, by, by January. And then you'll, you'll, you'll start your program in the fall. So next program would begin in September of 2023. Um, and then you spend the fall and the spring semesters taking classes. And the third, the third term, um, which could be summer or it could be the fall, would be when uh, students then complete their final essays or conduct research towards a thesis. And I'll get into those are the two different paths you can take to completing your master's program. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, people also, students also have the choice of using a summer term to do a co-op. Now, co-ops uh, is a very typical thing that people do here in British Columbia. It is uh, paid work experience that's facilitated by the university. We help you get a co-op in an area that is of interest to you. And so that would add, add then further terms to your studies. Um, the core classes that you have to take for the program that everybody uh, takes include the classes that you can see on your screen. And as you can see, we try to make sure people have the ability to take electives as well as core classes, but we want to make sure that everybody has a common set of academic experience, uh, of academic knowledge that they gain here at the university. Um, some of these are methodological classes. Some of these are classes that, uh, that um, prepare you for a career. Other ones are really about content, and I'm going to go through them just so you understand what they are. So IS 800. Um, it has this, a vague title called Problems of International Policy and Practice. I'm currently teaching this class. This is really a class to teach you, to give you some of the skills that you need in a career. So it teaches you how to write. Uh, we are doing, we're writing very intensive engagement in writing opinion pieces and writing literature reviews and doing practitioner interviews. So the students currently in this class are being asked to reach out to people in the fields that they want to go into to interview them and then to do 
uh, a report on that interview. So to understand what it takes to get into a field of transitional justice, or let's say you wanna work with, uh, with migrants, um, uh, what does it take to get into this field and what is working in this field like? Um, then IS-801, or institution, this is a content course. This is really trying to understand the institutions, policies, and economic development. I believe that Gerardo currently teaches this course, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is understanding sort of the building blocks of economic development and institution building in the world today. And then you can take an elective course as well. Uh, this semester, for example, many students took a course on inequality in the, in the public policy program. And students can do that. There are, you can take classes if you're enrolled here at SF, in our department, International Studies, you can take classes in political science and sociology and the public policy program uh, across the schools here at SFU. So that's a, that's a possibility as well. Uh, in the spring semester then, um, there is a class that I teach, IS-806 in State Failure and Reconstruction. That is, it gives you a very historical understanding. I, I want students to understand um, what kind of efforts are being made in this day and age in rebuilding states or in building states. We take a very critical perspective on this, trying to, uh, to, to criticize a lot of the current approaches taken by the donor community and the NGO community engaged in this sort of exercise. Um, and so we take a historical perspective going back to uh, going back to the Middle Ages in Europe and understanding how European states were built, comparing with China, South Korea, and some countries in Latin America, and then come around in the second part of the semester and try to understand, well, how do we then evaluate these various projects that are being undertaken in, within this framework of state building and reconstruction uh, in much of the global south today? Um, you can then take, if you are enrolled in the extended essays part of our curriculum, you can take an elective course as well in the spring semester, another elective course. So an elective course just means that it's whatever course that you want to take. It has to be approved by our program, but that's usually, as long as it's relevant to what you're doing, it's fairly easy. Um, and then IS-886, which is uh, a class that prepares you for pursuing your thesis, right? And so let me talk now about the extended essays versus the thesis. These are the two different ways for you to complete your master's program. If you take an extended essays, these are two essays that you write, and you can look on our website and it gives you more information. You can look and download a file called Graduate Handbook on our website. And the, with, that's the handbook basically that should answer all your questions about graduate studies here, including what the extended essays track looks like. The extended essays track um, has to write two essays. Um, that can be literature reviews, that can be desk research on a particular topic. It typically does not involve field research. If you're doing field research, and you can see the length of those essays and what they consist of in the graduate handbook, but they're, they're long, rigorous academic essays. Um, the second one is a thesis. And for the thesis, most people, but not everybody, base their thesis on field work. For example, uh, we have a fantastic student who's still in our program now, who is from Ghana and he did his field research on social movements in Ghana today. And he traveled to Ghana and he, um, um, he did research, he interviewed members of these social movements and he came back and he told us what it's about. And he's currently completing, completing his thesis. So that's a, that was a perfect example of what a thesis can be. Um, so it's again, academic, rigorous, but often involves field research and it ends up with one long essay, a thesis as we call it, rather than two separate extended essays. Um, uh, in the, in the, I see, so you could, in the summer, you could be also doing your co-op placement, but the co-op placement is not sufficient for, for graduation. You would do, you can do that, but you would still have to do an extended essay or a thesis component. Uh, and so you can see here, there's some flexibility in terms of when exactly you end the program, how long it takes you to, to, to do the program. That depends on what people have going on. Um, uh, but broadly speaking, this is the structure of the program. So here's some examples of, um, of extended essays and, and theses. I think the examples we have here below are examples of, actually, I'm not sure. Uh, Bridget, are these extended essays or theses? I think that they're a mixture of both, if I'm not mistaken. It looks to be a mixture of both. I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot confirm. Yeah, uh, anyway, the titles don't really tell us if these are, but these are examples of what some people have done. 
Um, we had a fantastic student from Nigeria here a few years ago who did some uh, uh, field, re I think this was a, a thesis, if I remember correctly, on re police reforms in Nigeria, understanding what kind of what had been done in terms of police reforms. Uh, another uh, student before I joined here did some did an essay on Trump's withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal. And so you can see what these different sort of things look like. The two extended essays are each of, of 8,000 words. There's no defense of that. If you do a thesis, the, it's typically around twice the length of that. So imagine putting two of those extended essays together and writing one long um, thesis. And that then must be defended in an oral defense. And so in other words, hey, it's not too high stress, but you you go up in front of a committee of, of professors and you um, we have questions, we ask you, and then we pass you after this oral defense. It's part of the, it's part of the exercise. Um, the co-op placements that students are allowed to do, and this is again, is facilitated by the university and our paid, uh, uh, paid co-ops, um, is again with the idea of getting you some practical experience in, in an area that you're interested in. Here are some places that students in the past have done co-ops at, Global Affairs Canada. A lot of them, as you can see, are with Canadian agencies and bodies at the national and the provincial level. Um, so National Defense Canada, again, a national agency. Many, uh, several of my students have done co-ops with Immigration, Refugees and Citizen Citizenship Canada. And that's because they're in particular interested as well in going into that field and perhaps even getting a job with the Canadian government in, in the future. And so here's some examples of that. It can, they can be domestic. There are some foreign placements for co-ops, but most of the majority of them uh, are in British Columbia or in Canada. Uh, and then what do people do when they leave our master's program? What can you expect? Well, some examples of students we put up here on the screen, you can see uh, the year they graduated in. So 2016 to 2010, 2015, 2017, 2012. Um, and they go into a variety of different things in, uh, for working for governments, the nonprofit sector and the profit sector. So uh, Daniel worked for the MasterCard Foundation, went to work for the Ma MasterCard Foundation. Uh, and you can see some of these people have their um, ha have their biographies up on our website. Uh, Jenna Dixon is with the UN Mission to Somalia, or worked with UN Mission to Somalia. Uh, Leon uh, Leanne Baumung worked for UNDP, so the United Nations Development Program, and uh, others work for the Canadian government. So you can see a wide variety of things that people go into after graduating from our program. So how do you apply? Well, the portal is open. You can apply now. In fact, we would encourage you to apply as soon as possible. Get your applications materials in, especially for those coming from the international, uh, from, from other countries. There are often additional requirements, and it takes time to get those done. So in addition, you'll see all the stuff on the website, but very often, depending on your country, uh, this will include uh, an English exam, so a TOEFL exam that you'll have to take. And we'll include transcript, academic transcripts and other things. And sometimes these can take time. So we encourage you to get working on this as soon as possible if you're interested, uh, if you're interested in this. Uh, the application deadline is January of 29th. And that's also when all of the supporting documents must be there. And so that's very important to understand. Uh, there is no flexibility, I believe, in, in that. And so you really have to have all the application materials in by January 29th of next year. Um, what we are looking for in terms of minimum requirements, but again, you can go onto our, the website and it tells you what these requirements are uh, and how to convert your own country's scores into what we use, which is a Canadian GPA average. We would require that average to be around 3.5 from a recognized universities, ideally in a discipline that's linked to international studies, right? Uh, there are also minimum requirements for the English test if you need to take an English test. And so I would make sure that you familiarize yourself with all of that uh, when you apply. Of course, we take many other things into consideration, including your, uh, uh, your written, uh, you, the, the written materials that you submit. So um, we're, we're trying to find the, obviously the most exceptional uh, and uh, students to, to be part of this program. So um, just the, I think the application process is, is quite straightforward. If you have questions, and Bridget, I believe, is either posted or will be posting this. You can always email us with questions with regarding the program. And I believe that's intst at sfu.ca, intst at sfu.ca. But 
Bridget will put that in the chat or already has put that in the chat. Uh, and so uh, I'll just walk you through this, uh, go to our, um, you can just Google apply to SFU International Studies and it'll call up, come up, but the instructions are on our graduate and postdoctoral studies website. There's a central website for graduate programs at SFU at Simon Fraser University, complete the online form. And so you need, um, you'll need, there's an application fee that you need to submit to get this done. The then afterwards, there's a, a, a CV, a curriculum vitae, a one page letter of intent. Um, and again, we read that. So it's important for us that we we see people who are committed, who are motivated and have a clear idea of why they want to be here. All right. So that's a that's an important part of this process. A one page statement of research interests. I would recommend that you familiarize yourself with the faculty here in our department when you write that so you can refer to the faculty when you're writing that one page statement of research interests saying for example i'm interested in doing this and the faculty and showing us that that's actually relevant to the kinds of things that we do here um an academic writing sample that academic writing sample ideally should be something that is uh that was written for an academic program some people apply and they've been out of school for a while they've been out of university for a while it's fine if this academic writing sample is a sample from several years ago or from five or six or seven years ago, uh, but it should be an academic writing sample if possible. Um, there should be contact information of three refugees, I'm sorry, refugees, ref referees. Two of these must be university faculty members. Um, again, you can contact, uh, or maybe Bridget can say a word if for those, that it does often come up that people say, uh, I've been out of school for several years or many years. I don't have contacts to the university anymore. Um, uh, I don't know, Bridget, do you want to say a word about what they should do if that's, a, if that's a challenge for them? Absolutely. I mean, what we generally say as a rule of thumb is uh, unless you've been out of school for a significant amount of time to the point where your past professors are no longer teaching, we highly prefer that all three of your references be academic rather than professional. It's in your best interest to submit as many academic references as possible, as only your former instructors can accurately attest to your ability to pursue graduate studies. From our experience, employer references typically speak on matters such as the employee showing up to work on time, meeting deadlines, being collegial, etc. While this is important information, uh, it is really not relevant to graduate studies. Sorry, didn't realize my camera was off there. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Just well, it's essentially, we strongly suggest that you try to get all three academic references. So uh, jog their memory, right? Write to your past professors, tell, tell them you were in their whatever class, you wrote papers on this or that includes a photo of uh, include a photo of yourself. Send them your academic CV, statement of intent, and research interests. In other words, give them materials so that they can write about you. And it's important. One of the, if I remember correctly, Bridget, it's important when they submit their references that that reference is submitted from their official email address. I think it, it is highly preferred that their reference letters come from their institutional email address rather than a personal Gmail or Hotmail or anything like that. And if possible, placing their their letter on institutional letterhead, so showing the school logo address, you know, um, all of that good stuff. Things that things that prove they are who they are when they're writing about you. Fantastic. So then uh, you don't, again, a copy of the transcript from all the institutions that you've attended. Uh, don't, me don't mail that hard copy at this time, uh, but the a copy is fine for, for the moment. Now, a question that often comes up is, can I contact faculty here in our department, uh, in our school ahead before uh, that, before or while I'm applying, will that help my application process? Um, you may, you don't need to, I think is the answer uh, to that. You're not admitted to our program to work with a particular professor. I get emails all the time from students saying, I would like to work with you. Uh, we may work together. Um, the actual process of allocating supervisors is something that happens once you've been admitted. And it happens uh, taking numerous factors into consideration. And so we cannot promise that you'd actually, you know, if you're here and you work on, I don't know, conflict in Sub-Saharan Africa, most likely you'll be working with me, even if I'm not your official supervisor, we'll be hanging out, we'll be talking with each other, obviously. But you don't need me uh, to, to give an okay for that 
for you to apply. You applied through the program, through the portal. You can get in touch with me. Feel free to do so. I can, we can, we can communicate, we can talk, but that doesn't necessarily need to happen for you to be admitted to the program. Um, I think I have gone through everything I wanted to go through. Bridget, is there anything that you wanted to add to what I said? Um, not at this time. I think, um, uh, you know, information will pop up for me as questions are asked, anything that's kind of slipped through the cracks. Um, so we could definitely could launch into a, a bit of a Q&A. Um, I've been answering a few questions as they pop up in the chat and we still have people joining us. So we'll just um, maybe take a moment once this person has joined the meeting room to mention that we are now through the formal presentation part of these of this maze info session but we will begin to take your questions and feel free to raise a hand and or uh, unmute yourselves uh, we'd love to see your faces um, now that now that the focus is kind of off the main presentation um, so yeah hop on in folks let me know let, let us know what you are interested in, in asking And if you are shy, again, of course, you, I'm going to put it in the chat here. You can email myself um, at intst at sfu.ca um, for anything you know you feel shy about uh, asking in front of such a group. Okay, there's some questions. Are there any questions? Uh, there's a lot of questions, actually. You've been oh. probably monitoring that, uh, Bridget. Are there stuff that you think we need to address? Um, I've answered everything that's been within the chat, but Gary here oh, okay. is, uh, has put up his hand. We'll go with Gary first and Josephine next. Uh, hi, Bridget. Uh, good morning. So to add up to my question, so I, the university's portal, how does it accept the IELTS uh, score? For example, I already have my TRF with me. And is there, because on the IELTS examination portal, I do not find any particular option to select that it will go, the score should go to the Department of Political uh, International Studies. Okay. The only option there is given that it is Office of Admissions. So is that fine? Uh, like yes, no, that, that's fine. It, it, it's not going to come to us specifically uh, at the School for International Studies. It will come to the, uh, it's graduate and postdoctoral studies at SFU. So yes, admissions department, it, it, that sounds right that sounds suitable um if you get stuck or you have any further trouble with that kind of thing i encourage you to reach out to the international uh, student advisors via the address i just dropped in the chat as well um, and they'll be able to assist with things that we're not able to answer such as you know postgraduate work permit um, eligibility this program is eligible but that's about as much as i can say in that regard so they kind of fill in the blanks where we we are unable to advise yeah, but Yes, but um, you should be able to just uh, request the electronic submission of your scores directly from your testing center to SFU. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Bridget, yeah, there's a question about the, the fees for the for domestic students. I think actually the fee is the same. The app, is that the application fee? I'm not sure what they're talking about in terms of fee. So yes, application fee is uh, $90 for domestic students. It's 125, uh, this is Canadian dollars, of course, for international students with international transcripts, I should say, students with international transcripts. Um, as for tuition fees, they are due every semester. Currently, it's about $2,025.64. Um, it does typically increase every, um, every September by about 2%, so maybe factor that in for next year. There could be a slight increase to that amount. Um, it's, uh, this is a, it's a research uh, program and it's paid per term. So every semester, essentially, you pay the same amount of tu tuition. Um, there is no application fee waiver at SFU, I'm sorry. Um, let's see what else, I've missed a couple here. Go there was a, uh, Eric, uh, Ryan had a question about uh, the fund, the full funding when it comes to tuition. So as we said in the, in the thing, in, in the presentation, we cover, we cover tuition for the first full year of the program. Uh, Bridget, yes. Is there, yes, is it, so what do students do after, after that? Because most of them don't finish in 12 months. No, um, honestly, you, you are on the hook for the rest of your funding. You will need to, you know, 
create a financial plan for yourself. We only guarantee funding for the first year and that is, essentially comes in the form of a $7,000 graduate fellowship, which would cover, you know, tuition every every term for the first three terms. Um, it will cover a, f a little bit of your ancillary fees and whatnot as well, but primarily that amount is only meant to cover tuition. You still need to, of course, account for living expenses and um, you know, medical insurance, anything else that might pop up during your life in Vancouver. Um, there is a budget tool I will try to dig up after we've gotten through some questions that might help you as a tool kind of uh, get a sense of what it will what it will look like, what, what the full cost will be for life in Vancouver during this program. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, Many of our students end up, uh, end up, it's not, we don't want our students to be here working full time, obviously, or even part time. But the reality is you're allowed uh, on a student visa to work, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Bridget, if you're an international student here. And so many of them, they work in our department. Many of them are TAs in our department, uh, but they'll also work elsewhere in, in Vancouver. So through mixing and matching. Now, we obviously strongly prefer to have students just focusing on their academics, but the reality of, um, of life in Vancouver means that even though they don't have to pay tuition, they still have to make money to, to live in Vancouver. So, you know, it's extremely cheap by standards of master's programs, but that doesn't mean it's free. Uh, uh, and it's mostly not free because it just costs money to live in Vancouver. Indeed, I'd, I'd agree with that assessment. Um, and of course, the, the $25,000 awards that are referenced, those are for, let's say, our biggest fish, it, 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 is, it is to attract um, a very meritorious student who likely has a track record of other, you know, multiple awards behind them, uh, being on Dean's List, etc. But it also has to do with academic promise. So if you show us that you are going to be a big star and make a big splash in this program, we will see what we can do. It's, um, I will put an asterisk there and say that no, nobody, no student has entered the program with a $25,000 award yet at this time. The highest award that we have doled out is 21,000. And that is spread out over three terms. So they would get 7,000 per semester for the first three semesters. We don't, there's a question about attending classes online. We are fully in person at the moment. Uh, and that's the way we prefer There may be one, I was at a conference in Philadelphia last week and I taught my class online. Uh, but that's a, that's an exception. The expectation is that everybody is here in Vancouver. Yes, thank you. I'm just typing that again in the chat as well. This is all at the Vancouver campus in person. You cannot attend this program online. Um, for someone who has a CGP of 3.44, what's the chance of applications? Um, we have to be quite ruthless, I'll, I'll admit, when uh, the Graduate Admissions Committee is reviewing files. They do a first sort of screening of CGPA and whether or not you meet the English requirement. Um, it's, you know, you'd still be considered at a 3.44. That's kind of, we get into the splitting hairs uh, area of, of all of that. But essentially, your, your package is evaluated as a whole. It's not just about the CGPA, although, of course, that's a strong indicator of performance. Um, it's not the end all be all. So, <laughs> where, um, Sorry, it's hard. You know what? It's hard to keep on one question when other questions keep popping up in the chat. I go, oh, I want to like the next shiny object. Let's go to that. Uh, well, the address right. for the Vancouver campus, uh, I will just write in the chat rather than speaking verbally. <laughs> and let yeah. me know. Also, Jason, if you've got a, if you can dig, comb through or take a couple of the questions with Sure. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and do that? So the question about reaching out to professors. Um... Let me see. Oh, no, I think Bridget just, uh, yes, reaching out to professors will not have a bearing on you being, ex it's not required to reach out to professors. Let me put it that way. Okay. But if you, let's say, for example, that you reach out to a professor and then you have a particularly, uh, you know, the, it's, it, it, it could be, it could help us flag your, your, um, uh, your application. So it's not, it's not required. It's not encouraged, but it's certainly acceptable. And it's certainly something that we do. Uh, we have, I think Josephine's been trying to have a question for a while. Though. So Josephine, why don't you go ahead? Hi, thank you. No worries. Uh, I'm Josephine Anati. I'm based in Accra, Ghana. And I'm also hoping to you know, join SFU in uh, fall 2023. Uh, I have a, a list of questions, so uh, bear with me. Um, on average, what percentage of African students are accepted in this uh, 
program, although you mentioned that you know you have uh, smaller class sizes. On average, so on average, what's the what that's accepted? The number who are accepted? Yeah, the percentage of African students. A percentage are who are accepted. So yeah. I'll, I'll jump in to say that we would typically receive about just under 200 applicants, maybe closer to 175, and we make offers to about 20 students from which there, there will be some attrition. People make other decisions, you know, they go to other schools or they just decline, it's, it's whatever. Um, so we typically end up with a cohort of between like 12 and 16 people out of that. So that's so an, I think it's an acceptance rate of something on the order of 20, uh, sorry, 10, yeah. 10, 10, 12 percent or something like that. Yeah, indeed. indeed. Sorry, Josephine, go ahead. You had other questions as well. Yes, um, I wanted to also find out that usually when uh, the students hear back um, after the application, is it after the deadline? Yes, indeed. You will hear back in, uh, you should hear back in late February or early March. All right. Okay. Yes, and the, uh, continue. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Josephine. Yes, I actually also had a question about um, uh, are there any active you know, student groups centered on things like international security, but I realized that with the smaller group sizes, that may not be the case, right? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. We, uh, we do not further cohortize the program oh, okay. within the single cohort into yeah. thematic areas, no. And, and for, the, for the record, um, if anybody has seen on the academic calendar that regional concentrations are available for this program, they are not. Um, it's not exactly a misprint, but long story short, they have been suspended because we don't have the available classes to offer that. Um, however, it's, it was simply just a, sort of a denotation on your transcript once you graduated from this program. So it, it's nothing really, it's not too big a deal. Um, any tips for creating a strong, a strong application? There's, there are many, um, but you know what, Jason, you're, you're on the admissions committee this year and you've been on it in the past. What do you want to see? What do you, what to you makes a strong application? Um... I don't know. It's difficult to say. We look. Well, we certainly want people. What's key to succeed in this program is you need to be able to to think and write. Right. <laughs> it's pretty basic. Um, so if we wanted people strong, strong analytical writing is what we look for, and also we try to further in this program. So if you apply and your application has grammatical mistakes or is not well structured, that will be a red flag for us. Now, obviously, we also want people who have strong academics. And so, you know, looking at your GPA, it's a blunt tool and it's not all we look at, but we do look at your GPA or whatever it is, the score, your score translated into a GPA or your, your grade average. We look at that. We look at your institution, where you're graduating from. Now, we take people from all kinds of institutions around the world. Um, we love getting applicants from, uh, from all around the world. And we've done a lot of work in trying to do outreach. I myself do a lot of outreach to African universities to try to get people from there to apply. We, we, we see as part of our, our raison d'etre is attracting people from around the world into this program. You, uh, if people not have a, English as a native language, that's fine, but they need to speak fluent English uh, because all the classes are English, all the writings in English. And so that's that's a key aspect uh, as well. And then finally, you know, often if people uh, can people can make up or you know add to their application or make up what they may be lacking in other areas by a compelling personal story. So, for example, we had an applicant um, uh, last year who was whose GPA wasn't as wasn't as high as we would have liked, but had been a committed and dedicated activist in the democracy struggle in a country. And in fact, he spent so much of his time doing that, that that probably had affected uh, his academic record. And so having a compelling personal story as well that's related to our program is also uh, often, uh, it's certainly assessed and it's often important as well. Um, there is no interview part of the application process. I just saw that come in. Uh, maybe, uh, Josephine, did you have other questions that you wanted us to address? Yes, please. I do have um, another one. So typically, how is it uh, like for, a day in a day uh, for a student. Usually, how our classes they run to like morning to evening, and right. then uh, so at the end of the the term, are, are there exams? And do you have uh, classes right. on weekends? Like typically, uh, how is it like um, a day in the life of a 
MAS students? So, I mean, a lot of our students live, our students live all over the place. And some of them, there are, there are some student housing downtown that some, some of them live, but our students typically live across Vancouver. They come then all of, I would say, all of our classes are held here at Harbor Center downtown. So I'm just gonna angle my computer here. So <laughs> That's the, the port of Vancouver right there, or one of the ports oh, of Vancouver. You it's coming see. into focus. Uh, you can't really see much, a whole lot, I guess. But you can look at a map. Uh, all of our classes are at the downtown campus here in, in Vancouver. The main SFU campus is up on the hill in Burnaby. So if you Google SFU, you're gonna see the main university campus which is a beautiful, massive campus. I mean, I think SFU has 25,000 students or something like that. That is not where we teach our classes. We teach our classes down here at Harbor Center, which is in downtown Vancouver. Um, and so students will come here. The class time, you can check it online. You can just look at what kind of classes are being held for this semester. Um, it depends on, you know, it depends on scheduling, basically. But they're usually during the day. There are some evening classes. Um, but a lot, I think the bulk of the classes are in the morning and the afternoon. We teach typically each class, there'll be one, a class will meet once a week and for, for three to four hours. So um, there are very long classes that we break up. Uh, it's a small cohort. So a lot of it's interactive. Um, we, I tell the students that this program depends on them and how much they want to invest in it. This is not a, a program where you're going to be lectured at You'll be lecture, there'll be lectures, but most of the learning or most of the time you spend will not be spent in lecture halls, but in you know group discussions, breakout groups, et cetera, et cetera. There, I think to my knowledge, we don't have any exams. Most of the most of the uh, exams are are essays. So most most of the the, the grade requirements come through essays. Um, the course requirements rather are, are come through essays. Uh, sometimes we do quizzes, in-class quizzes. Sometimes we do presentations and group work, but it's all that sort of format. So it's very little of it is actually, you know, working on a multiple choice question or an essay kind of, an essay, uh, sorry, an exam kind of format. Um, so, so that's sort of what the semester looks like. The, the, you can look at the academic dates. We start the fall semester in September. It goes till early December. Uh, essays, I think, and grades have to be submitted by mid-December, and it's a similar thing for the spring semester uh, again as well. So a day in the life, I mean, actually very little of the week is classes. I don't know what it would be, probably about, you know, you probably, let's see, you have, you have three, usually three classes in the fall semester. I'm just looking back at the, yeah, there's three classes in the fall semester. So that roughly shakes out to about 12 hours in the classroom in the week. And then the rest of it is reading, is preparing, um, and some people obviously work as well. Again, we don't encourage that, but that's just a fact of life. Uh, so that's roughly, I think, what the what the what the week looks like. And I think Josephine's put her hand down, so I I will assume we've answered that question question, and we'll go on to the next one because there's a bunch of questions. And thank you for your patience, uh, Elijah and Joku. Elijah, are you still with us? Yeah, I see Elijah has. Uh, okay, there. yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Can yes. you hear me, please? I can, yes, go ahead. Okay, please. Uh, very, thank you very much for the clarifications. I just have um, uh, one more question about um, one of the documents required for the application that is a research, research proposal, kind of. I, I would like to know the level of detail that is expected in the research proposal or right. uh, that kind of document. Uh, that's one, but related also, how do you view a research proposal that is specific, for instance, with a particular case study uh, for a particular place or, or rather than just the one that is general? So how does the committee, admission committee, look at the two? What's their preference, if, if I may know? Thank so, thank you, Elijah. So the, the research proposal is a one page document. It's a statement of research interest. And so it's not a long document. What we want to know is several things. First of all, can you can you write fluently and structure a one pager in a way that is compelling? So just actually the structure, the logic, the writing is something that we look at. Uh, secondly, is this something that is relevant to what we do here in international studies? Third, uh, thirdly, is um, uh, thirdly, is 
this something that's feasible for you to do? Let's say, for example, you know, if you wanted to say, I'm going to compile a data set of, you know, all, all migrants uh, all around the world. And, you know, if, it's, if we see that something is way too ambitious, well, it's, we're going to flag that. So we want to know it's something that's it's possible to do. It's feasible. It's well-structured and articulated. And again, it's only a one pager. So it's only part, it's, it's a very short amount of uh, space that you have uh, to do that. It can be on a, working on a particular case. You say, I want to look at, um, uh, I want to look at the impact of climate change on, on conflict, local conflicts in Kenya. You know, and you say something like that and, and one, or it could be something that's broader uh, over numerous countries or that's more theoretical. Okay, thank you very much. That's, that's okay. I think I'm, I'm satisfied. Thank you, Elijah. Um, I think uh, there is, I'm just going from left to right across the, the, the top of my screen. Uh, Wale, uh, I believe that's how you pronounce your name. Yes, yes, Zude, thank you, that's how I pronounce my name. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Hi. Yeah, um, I would like to ask, you know, I have a degree in German language and French from Nigeria. Currently, I am at the University of Georgia where I'm running in the United States, where I'm having my master's degree in German language and linguistics. Oh, I have a very official that those GP who have a second class of a of CGP 3.5 on 5.0 scale. So then I'm thinking with this GP, although I have but, uh, I have uh, actually took part in some um, um, relevant works, voluntary works. Uh, I, I, and some other things that I have done. So I am thinking with this academic background and the CGPA, do I have any chance at all? So I, I didn't hear all of everything you said, Wale. You said, what was your GPA? Was it 3.5? Yes, 3.56 on 5.0 scale. And then I have a background in German language and French. Right. I currently have my master's degree in German language and linguistics at the University of Georgia. Am I relevant okay. in any way? Yes, so I mean we don't exclude that would be that would be ex we're not going to exclude you based I mean German language is not you know we're obviously not a linguistics program, but we would look at your entire application. Uh, it wouldn't exclude you from being accepted um, and your GPA is satisfactory and so that would that would also not exclude you often what we do is we look at not only the entire GPA, but we look at if there's been a progression within the GPA so say for example we see you had a very low GPA at the beginning of your studies, but that then increased to a much higher GPA over the course of your studies, we'll take that progression into account as well. And so on our spreadsheet that we have in the admissions committee, there'll be a, an overall GPA, and then there'll be a last, last year, I believe, uh, GPA as well that we look at. Okay. And then once you've applied before, what is the chance that you will still be denied again? Because I've applied sometimes ago, I applied to SFU and the University of Georgia last year, from Nigeria, then I got admitted to Georgia, then got rejected in SFU so, for this program. So I feel like since I have been rejected sometime before, was the chance of being rejected or being accepted this time around? We, we do not uh, take into consideration your past attempts, at least to my knowledge. Uh, it may be something that I don't think our system flags that, Bridget. Does our, does our system flag that? <laughs> so. Unless you consider me the system, uh, which I, I do see the names that have come up year after year. And sometimes it, go, I, it triggers for me and I go, let's look at last year's applications. It, but like Jason was saying, it doesn't have any bearing on the consideration or evaluation of your application for this year. Um, it's something that we might note but it is not going to uh, give, you, give you a higher or lower chance of being admitted. I, I would say, you know, if, if you've been denied before, it does seem likely you might be denied again. Um, but that is maybe just an internal bias. <laughs> um, I, it's, it's hard to speak to that question, but I understand where it's coming from. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And then lastly, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about this. I, I just have to be quick. And lastly, when we're talking about uh, the research interest that I would like to work with, are you getting what I'm trying to say? What should this be based on, actually? Because sometimes, I mean, I believe maybe that was where the problem came from the last time I applied. I mean, the research interest, I mean, my research interest, the one page is research intent, or, yeah, 
that we have to write what should it actually entails. Like, I will be very happy if I have enough details about that. Please. We, I'll say that we purposefully do not provide much criteria for the academic writing sample. Um, there is criteria for the letter of intent and statement of research interest. They should be one page long. But for the academic writing sample, because people are applying from all sorts of different programs, they're coming from many different academic backgrounds, it could be maybe a policy paper, a literature review, it could be like a, a comparative piece. Um, it, can, it can really be quite almost anything. Um, so I have two questions here in the chat too that kind of relate to what you're asking. And should the academic writing be like, uh, be one that is published like in journals? Somewhat, depending on, again, the background that you're coming from. If you have a sort of journal-esque article that you've produced, that would be fantastic. Um, but if you have, you know, if, if it's something just, just kind of more of a report or something, that would also be accepted. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of leeway for that. That's specifically why we do not provide criteria because we we anticipate receiving quite a wide variety of academic writing samples of all all different shapes and sizes, basically. Um, and so, how many words or uh, pages or words does the writing sample need to be? There's no limit. There's no minimum. There's no maximum. Just just share something that you would be proud uh, for the admissions committee to read and and be a you know and have that be a reflection of you and your work. That's all I would say. Okay. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that is helpful. Thank you very much for that. Okay, thank you, Wale. Um, Aaron Duti, we can go to you. Would you like, do you have a question? Hello, sir, am I audible? Yes, yes you are, go ahead. Okay, so sir, I'm from India and I have uh, done my master's, my master, I completed my master's three months back. And I'm interning for my second master's at SFU. So my question uh, relates to the fact that uh, I'm not really sure if I can get my transcript for the master's that the master's I done recently. So I want to ask, uh, what if I cannot arrange the transcript by 29th of January? So what are the options that I have? Bridget, you want to take that? <sighs> Sorry, could you repeat the end? the end the last sentence yes of course so i wanted to ask uh, since i completed my uh, masters recently like very recently so i'm not uh, sure if i can arrange a transcript for that by the end of january oh i so see sorry uh, yes absolutely that's not a problem um for application purposes uh, an unofficial or in progress transcript will suffice um as if you will need to receive your hard copy transcript if you were to be accepted uh, by essentially September of 2023 by before you start classes, it would be great to have it in then, but there's no um, there's no rush to get that hard copy official one, especially seeing as you completed so so recently. Okay, thank you for your answer, but I actually wanted to ask what if I'm not able, uh, not even able to arrange the uh, soft copy in fact, because my university is uh, not even giving me the certificate right now, maybe it will take some time. So what if I cannot get a hold of the soft copy in fact? Um, in that regard, do you have, um, ooh, do you have any other kind of academic reporting at your institution that would at least show us where your grades are at for for your specific courses, like yes. any anything that's similar to a transcript. Yes, I have a mark sheet for, for all the four semester that I did. So I have all that right now. I don't have the certificate or the transcript, and I I don't think I'll be able to get it by January. Like I'm really doubting that part. It's. I would say for this one, write to me. Write to me at i n t s t. Um, one second, okay. I'll, I'll drop it in the chat again, um, just because I think it, it might just need a little bit more scrutiny um, before I can provide an answer. Okay, no, thank you so much. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Yes, sir? No, no, go ahead. Okay, uh, I also had two other questions that are, uh, I want to ask, can I get the course outline for the individual courses if I request it in the mail? Because since I'm like doing this master's for just to build up my research capability more and to do a major specialization since I intend to do a PhD further. So I'm wondering uh, if I can get the uh, detailed course content for the specific courses, courses that I'm going to choose. So is it possible via mail? 
So you can, uh, what you can do is you can email, you can check out what we have posted online. So that gives you the a very brief course overview. Just so just Google the course that you, uh, that you are yes. interested in online. Uh, you can, if you want the syllabus, which is much more, yes. which gives you the week by week, which readings you have to do, that changes every time that we teach the class a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. You can email individual, I know you've been in touch with me already. You can email me or other professors uh, who are teaching a particular class. Uh, and that again, yeah. you can find out by looking online and ask them if they would be willing to share the syllabus uh, with you. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. My third question is, uh, sir, uh, since in India, first class is regarded uh, beyond the boundary of 60%. So if I have 65% or 62% marks, am I eligible for the eligibility criteria? I mean, I'm really doubting the part because uh, here first class means something else and in Canada, it's something else. So you have to look uh, at, the, you look at the, the website. SFU has a grade point average, has a conversion tool. Uh, Bridget, correct me if I'm wrong, where you can see what Indian grades will correspond to in, in Canadian grades. Is that right, Bridget? Um, well, so there is, I'm just going to drop this into the chat. Uh, ooh. This isn't one of these specific, uh, like program uh, country specific links for program requirements at SFU. So I've dropped in India as a, as an example. So you can scroll down for admission to a master's program, the minimum overall academic standing, which is the minimum that you need to be admitted to any program at SFU, not just ours, is first class or eight on a 10 point scale. If you do not meet that, um, also with you need an MA. It's showing that an MA or an MSc, et cetera. Um, if you do not meet that, you're not eligible to for admission. So I wouldn't. Okay. So uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, this nope. masters, uh, this first class should be uh, by the Indian standards, right? Um, that that is uh, whatever set out by SFU's Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies is taking like comparable standards from each country around the world and trying to apply them to what our minimum entry standards are. So it's that's the rough conversion. We do not really have a perfect conversion. I'll, I'll tell you that it's it's difficult when every country has very different means of evaluating their students. Um, there's different there's different methods. There's different ways of ranking. But we essentially our program and myself as the, as the graduate program assistant helping out the admissions committee, we all have to go by the book of what is listed there on these country specific lists. So if, if you're at a seven on a 10 point scale, for example, we would simply have to say no, we, we cannot, we don't have a means of, of admitting you without oh. very strong argument. <laughs> and um, frankly, we, we need people that we don't really, um, like we'll admit people who we don't have to fight too hard for. Um, people who are clear cases of, yep, yeah, this, this person is a great fit. They need an offer. You know, um, what else can I say there? There's a bit, of, there's a bit of extra noise. Um, I think yeah, there was somebody who was mute, unmuted. I just okay. muted them. Yeah. If Sorry, could, and I was raising my voice over yeah, it. Sorry, could, everyone. If you could just, if you could just raise your hand if you wanna, if you wanna speak. So, Aaron Dutia, we answered your questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got it. Uh, I just uh, for the last question, I just wanted to ask: uh, Do we do we have the option of research methodologies classes uh, yes. during? It's, our it's not just an option; it's a requirement. There's a, there's a, usually in the second semester, you take a take a research methods class that covers qualitative and quantitative methods and prepares you for your extended essays and thesis. That's uh, Professor Irene Pang who usually teaches that class. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I will just add one last question. Uh, sorry for delaying. I just want to ask that uh, in case I'm rejected by the university and I'm just um, not offered for the admission, uh, would the reason for the rejection would be there in the mail so that I can just prepare myself for the next time? I don't believe that we give, we answer, we, we give explanations with regards to rejections. Correct, Bridget? Apologies, no, we, we do not have the capacity or the means to be able to do so. Um, there's, there's far more suitable applicants than we're able to make offers for. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's just a bit of a numbers game and it, you shouldn't get too discouraged if you receive a no from, from, from us and our admissions process. There's always another, another opportunity for you down the road.
You know, you can, uh, you can always try your luck and send us an email and ask us why, if we can give you any, any more information. And if that email ends up with, if you send that to Bridget, she may, she could send it on to an admissions committee member. I'm not going to promise you that we will get back to you, but, uh, but that would be, that would be an option for you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go on to uh, PA Golden. Uh, do you have a question? Or the person who is registered as PA Golden here. Thank you, sir. I think most of my questions have been answered. Okay. But I want to know the 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 criteria for the presentation, especially when you have to do with your thesis. Are you the one going to select the topic, or you select the topic based on uh, maybe guidance from the professor that is teaching that? So for the thesis, it's entirely, it's, we really, and again, this is a program that where success is really based on a student's dedication and initiative, right? So we're here to, so I, I for example, I went to school in, in Europe for a while, in parts of Europe, it's a very professor dominated uh, discipline. And so the professor gives students a subject to work on and the students then work on the subject. That's not at all our approach here. The approach is the student comes, the student says, I'm passionate about understanding, I'm gonna do a deep dive into uh, Islam and Boko Haram in Nigeria. Go for it. And this professor is then there to help you, for advice, to shepherd you, to give you feedback and criticism, but it's the student who picks the subject and the student who's then responsible for completing, uh, for completing the, the thesis on the subject. Thank you so much. And then the last one I want to look at is the admission process. Uh, maybe that one I'll email you and then I'll get the feedback from you then. Okay. Thank thanks. you so much. Yes. No problem. I'm so Our grateful. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. So we're going to try to get to all the questions. We'll stay here until we can get through all the questions. Uh, we have a few left to go. Uh, let me see. I see um, uh, Guyo Haro uh, is, has, has uh, their hand up. Yes. Good morning, team at uh, SFU. I'm uh, actually from Kenya, and I have two questions. One is whether, pardon? Karibu sana. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jason. Karibu, Santi. So my question is uh, whether the course actually leads to any specialization. Uh, and then the second question is uh, on the referees whether you can actually pick um, referees from other university, uh, other than the university that you've attended? Mm, that's an interesting question. So I think with regards to your first question, the program is as I described. So it's a broad program uh, and the specialization depends on the student really. So for example, um, uh, what can I say? We have a student who's very interested in migration and labor rights. Uh, and, you know, our program is not a program on migration and labor rights, right? Doesn't, you don't come out with a master's in migration from us. You come out with a master's in international studies, but the student is then able, what we then encourage the student, you know, the student is able to do a lot of reading on this subject. Uh, we have tried to put the student in touch with experts in that field. So the student will call them and speak with them. Uh, we've tried to organize co-op opportunities with agencies or NGOs that work in that field. And so the, the student can very much specialize in a particular area. In fact, this program is very much a program that's structured around the interests of the students. I would say that the students who succeed in this program are students who come here with a fairly good idea about what they're passionate about. It doesn't, it's not a requirement, but that will really help them, I think, in succeeding here. They come here and then we will you know, do everything we can to help, to help that student. And I think there's a, you know, it's a small, it's a very small, it's a very, very small program with a lot of individualized attention. But if the student really comes with a good idea, then that student will have a much better chance of succeeding and specializing. But the program is broad, as you can see. Um, and just to, just to hop in, sorry, I just wanted to clarify that there's no formal specializations in this program. It would just be, you know, about the, the specialization focus of your research. That's all that's being discussed here. Absolutely. So for the second thing, I don't know, um, I'll, uh, what I would say, I don't know if Bridget has some advice on this. I am going to hop in on that one too, if I may. Just, okay. I, I, I will say your, for the application, your references should be 
uh, university professors who have taught you in the past. These shouldn't be professors who are friends at, at other institutions. Do you know what I mean? These should be people who have had you in their classroom in exactly. the past. Thank you. Exactly. So I think it's, it's fine if there's a referee from another institution, but you need to argument, give us a, a rationale or a reason why, you know, you are, if you're going, for example, you know, if you were a student at the University of Nairobi, but we get a referee from Moy University, you have to tell us why you're giving us a referee from Moy University. If you took classes with them or they were an advisor on your committee, then that would make sense. If it's just somebody you happen to know, that makes less sense. Thank you. And I think one last question is um, in terms of uh, the academic writing sample, whether somebody could be allowed to use maybe some out output of uh, maybe previous work in terms of like uh, consultancies? We highly advise against using anything that was created for work, like in a professional capacity, because we don't know what kind of clearance you have for those documents. We don't know the level of confidentiality <laughs> they're supposed to have. So, we, you know, I understand it could be something you're really proud of, like this was a glowing report that we wrote about X topic, but if it's owned by your company at the end of the day, if the work you do for them is owned by that company or institution, it gets a little questionable. <laughs> now, we might not necessarily be able to know um, whether it's coming from work or, or, a jo or a, uh, academia. It, it should be kind of clear, but we would definitely prefer papers from yeah. school. What I, would, yeah. Yeah, what I would say, just to, I agree totally with what Bridget just said, um, you know, if, because we often get this question, right? People graduated six years ago, they feel like what they did as an undergraduate doesn't represent their abilities. And maybe they've done, as you are intimating, they've done a lot of work in the meantime where they've become much more knowledgeable and better writers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if there is, with the caveat of what Bridget just said, which is that we don't, we much prefer stuff from a university or an academic institution. If you have a strong argument for something else, then make then put that argument either at the top of the essay or in your personal statement when you send it to us and flag that. I'll be on the admissions committee this year, so I'll see that. So after, as Bridget said, 100%, we prefer it to be an academic. But if there's a reason, a very strong reason why that's not the case, you know, we're a flexible program and we'll take a look at that and make sure that that's considered as well. Um, did, I think that was uh, the, the last question. In fact, I think, oh, we, oh, yes, I think we have a couple new ones. Uh, a couple new ones, yes. Gary, Sorry, do you want to go ahead? And we'll take okay. Mary Claire. Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to go ahead with the question. So, Bridget, I have one question for you. Uh, so, with respects to eligibility for the program, I have a three-year undergraduate degree from India. So, the pro SFU's website for eligibility on international admissions does state that academic... Uh, you know, students who have a three-year undergraduate degree from India with university, uh, with, uh, taking universities, explicitly they are graded by NAC on an A-plus grade. They are eligible. So would the department follow that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, are, were you, was your standing first class? Yeah. I yeah, have oh, a so GPA of 9.19 out of 10. That's just fine. So yeah, three year degrees are an acceptable basis of, of admission. You're asking to make sure that you don't need another MA yes. degree before applying to ours. And that is correct. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. You, you meet that, uh, that caveat there. So not to worry for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then you are eligible to apply. Professor, uh, uh, Professor Jason. So sir, what are the departmental requirements to be a TA? And does the department roll out TA ships with the offer letter? along with the funding? That's another question. I think Bridget probably have a better time answering than, than I would. Um, so uh, TA ships are not um, included as a part of the offer letter, but jobs are advertised as they become available. So ahead of, ahead of the fall semester, uh, you know, late summer, these jobs would be advertised by our program manager, Ellen Yap, um, who you would meet if you were admitted to this program eventually. Um, and she coordinates all of the TA ship uh, things. Um, I will say that if you have received a sort of a higher amount of funding, it's less likely you'll receive a TA position because they're trying to make sure, you know, with those jobs, they're providing financially for those with lesser funding, essentially. Um, so I would say we don't have information on applying for the TA ships just yet because 
you would only apply when they're available. Um, but and so what was the other part of that question? Just what? what are the departmental requirements? I believe there might be a certain entry GPA level to become a TA. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we will admit everyone of a certain CGPA level. So it's kind of, it kind of goes to argue that anybody that we admit to the cohort would be able to TA um, based on their strengths. But yeah, there's a little bit more sort of finesse to it, you know, the small things to slot yeah. in. But you, you pro you'd likely have a good chance of being awarded a TA ship, would you apply to one? Thank and you so much. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. They'll be advertised every term as they're available. You'll get to know yep. which, which class they're for, which professor you'd be working with, all of that good stuff. And there's also, I should mention, the opportunity to apply for TA ships and RA ships outside of this department, uh, as long as you have an appropriate academic background to be able to support those those classes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, the next, I believe, was Marie Claire. Hi everyone, thank you for the opportunity. So I actually came in late and I would like to know if there will be another session of this, if no, possible. No, we're gonna, we're gonna post this, we're, we're, it's recorded and we'll post it on our YouTube channel. Actually, I don't know what our YouTube channel is. I'm assuming if you Google it, you can find it, but uh, maybe we can, we'll post, we'll put it in the chat, but um, we're gonna post this on the SFU International Studies YouTube channel. And if you have additional questions that you don't find answered there, then you can mail the intst at sfu.ca. That's that's Bridget's uh, email address. I've okay. never I've never uploaded anything myself to the YouTube channel. I think that's our communications um, staff person, Kaylin. But I think this is the link. <laughs> it looks like it's all our stuff. So okay, good. that's where you can follow us, and this is where the um, maze info session will go. You can even look at the one from ten months ago if you'd like, <laughs> the one we did last year. But um, yeah, the, 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 the criteria the eligibility, that's all stayed the same. So there shouldn't be too many big changes, but yeah, you're, this is all still being recorded. So the whole thing, including your question, will all be up there. All right, thank you so much. No problem. Uh, Arunduti, you have another question? Yes, sir. I wanted to ask if I have a journal publication, can I send it uh, as a writing sample? I mean, um, can published works be sent? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that we have exhausted the questions, unless there's questions in the, if anybody else has any questions, put, uh, Zara is asking a question. Zara, go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for this uh, informative session. Uh, my question is, the course says, uh, or according to the website, it says it's a one-year course. But uh, from the discussion, I um, found out that it could take longer. Correct. So um, I'm asking this uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, I know guys already said uh, the, the uh, on questions on postgraduate uh, work permit is not your area and you can't answer on that but i, I just wanted to know how is this uh, course uh, classified is it a one-year course or it depends on the length of uh, your study and how long it takes you so zara we always advertise this as a 12 to 24 month long program of study and uh as you, you might have missed in the in the beginning of the presentation when jason was going over the different program completion options whether you go for extended essays or thesis it it, it will depend so the, the soonest you can complete this program is in 12 months three semesters opting for the extended essays option where you're mostly relying on sort of sec you're doing like secondary research you're, you're going to the books and you're creating new written works out of that however if you opt for thesis you're going to need a term of research and travel most likely that will take you out of out of vancouver to go do that you'll come back and then in your final fourth semester making that 16 months um, that's when you would write and defend your thesis um, there's other options of course too like co-op uh, working and learning opportunities that can add another semester so that is why we say it's between 12 and 24 months uh, but on average as jason said it is likely um, 
yeah, like 16, 16 or 20 actually is quite typical for most of our right. students. They don't necessarily take the full 24, but mm -hmm. all of your um, paperwork, when you get your admission letter, like your, your offer letter with, with everything detailed on it, I think it actually does describe this as a 24 month long program just to cover the top end for our international students and visa applications. Um, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. This was okay. helpful. Okay, I'm not sure. Uh, Arunduti, do you still have a question? I see your hand that's still up. No, nope, I'm extremely down. sorry, sir. I just oh, missed No it problem. I do that all the time, too. Uh, let's see if Wale, do you have a question again? Yes, I have a question. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So I'm very sorry about this, too. One thing is, uh, I have left uh, the, the university, I mean, my undergraduate university for over, uh, let me see, just three years now, three years now, since 2019. And then I'm already in the London University already for a master's degree. But now I don't know if my lecturers, I mean, my professors in the university and my undergraduate university will still have some of my details and they'll be able to write a recommendation on my behalf. However, I I just I'm just my I don't really want to have this recommendation from my professors right now because they might have they might not be able to write much about me or even personally I want to make it confidential. So I don't know what do you think I do? I think before I left Nigeria, I was working for some other for uh, the Nigeria Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Do you think I can just go and collect I get a recommendation letter for my my bosses, I mean, my supervisors at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or something. I don't know how to do about the recommendation right now because that's my edict right now. Okay, yeah. well, one second, Wale. So I, I would say I'm going to drop some information in the chat here, which was, uh, which was what I read aloud earlier. Unless you've been out of school for a significant amount of time, right, we're to the point where your professors are no longer teaching, we still prefer that most of your references be academic. If you are struggling to uh, find those those professors or to reach out to them or whatnot, then yes, you know I think we we could take um, one or two out of the three letters could be professional references more more so than than academic, but we highly prefer academic references. Um, that's really all all I can say on that without going blue in the face, but. Um, you know, one professional reference, that'll be okay. Two is pushing it a little bit, but we'll still accept it, you know. Um, just who can most accurately attest to your abilities, skills, and capacity for graduate work? That's what we're going for, I think. Okay. Uh, there's a question by Mina, a good question about, do we help with international co-op placements with international NGOs? I think in a limited to a limited degree. Uh, Bridget, do you have anything um, to say about that? And it, it, it's not us as well, just, just by right. the way that it's the co-op office that coordinates all of those placements. And I can tell you from, uh, from just practical experience, I think most of most of the placements are with the Canadian government um, and with uh, some, some of the organizations that Jason had the logos up earlier. Um, sure there may be limited, limited placements available with international NGOs, but I don't think that's where a lot of the um, professional relationships are just with SFU in general. Um, I would inquire with the co-op office if you have any general questions about where they are able to send people for work. Um, let me find their address again contact us I think, uh, let me see, where is the... and we are uh, we are in the faculty of arts and social sciences so this is why it says arts co-op at sfu.ca yeah you can see again there there's, there's some past co-op experiences i think on the screen if you should be able to see that now uh on my screen so uh, of course yeah, there I, are plenty of more but yeah. uh, these are some great examples. Now, what what people have done in the past is they've they've gotten, for example, you know, I work uh, I work in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and so some of my students are I'm I'm trying to help them with opportunities there. That's outside of this, and that's not a co-op, right? That's just trying to get experiences. Uh, in some cases, they're doing volunteer work. In other cases, we're trying to arrange for payment through that. So there's other options available, but obviously, the easiest thing through the university are these co-ops. 
So let's see. Uh, we have uh, Emmanuel has another question. I'm just gonna, Emmanuel, did you uh, wanna unmute yourself? Yeah. Hello, Jason. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for the session. I want to ask about the number of courses uh, students take in a semester and how many electives that you are supposed to take. So Any elective it's courses. three courses a semester and it starts with two, um, two required courses and an elective in your first semester, another two required courses and a possible elective depending on the track you are opting for in your second semester. I'm just going to go back to our program structure page which will give you a sample timeline. So the link that I've dropped in the chat just now features, you know, fall, spring, summer, and the next fall sort of breakdown. And so you'll see, oh, and I should, I should mention actually, there's a third course that is still taking time to get in my radar. IS 879 Career De Development Seminar. That was introduced this semester, actually, in addition to the two core required courses there. Um, and I won't get into that bit just, just now as we're having some changes with that occurring, but uh, essentially fall and spring, you'll have two required courses each and an elective, or if you opted for the thesis, you'd be doing IS 886, which is your thesis perspective course, which is helping you um, get, your, get your ideas in order, getting your, uh, your research thoughts all in line that, you know, creating your perspectives before heading into the actual work of your thesis. Um, and that needs to be approved before you would be allowed to enroll in the thesis course in a, in a uh, next semester. Okay. So I hope that shows again, sort of the breakdown with um, whether or not you're doing co-op. Um, and again, under summer where it says extended essays or thesis completion or co-op placement, I want to underscore again, that co-op placement is not a method of completing this program. It is simply saying that's another option for you in that term. And then you could complete, yeah, next semester. I'm gonna try to see, uh... Uh, if we can upload the slide, because somebody asked, are we gonna post these slides? We can try, I'm gonna see if we can do, I'm not gonna promise it, but I'll try to see if we can do that on our SFU International Studies webpage. Uh, I think that could be helpful for people just to go to. So I'll, 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 I'll let you know on our Twitter feed if, uh, it's a good thing to actually follow SFU uh, IS, the International Studies Program on our Twitter, that's the way we interact with people. And so we'll try to post that there and then our website as well. We have a question from Blossom. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Okay, so um, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I just wanted to ask, for someone like me that I'm not really particular on the research um, topic I would like to go on, is it possible to capture about two research topics in my um, research statement of interest and um, probably mention faculty members that I've seen or I've gone through the website and I've observe that they are interested in fragments of what I'm interested in. You know, Does that I, um... you know what I would say, Blossom, is, is um, this is just some advice. It's not, you could probably do that if you wanted to, but what I would recommend, you know, what you say in your research proposal, nobody's going to hold you to that. We're not going to say, <laughs> oh, you have to do this because you applied with this research proposal. In fact, what this more is, is just the notion, does this student, is this applicant, are they capable of formulating a cogent, strong proposal. You can throw that out the window after you're applied. So I wouldn't be worried that we're going to hold you to it, which is why I would recommend you probably just to pick one because uh, it's going to be easy. You only have one page and you don't, only have, don't have too much time to develop it. Just pick one and say, and just pretend like that is what you're going to do, right? I mean, obviously, it's something I hope you're interested in, but that may be easier to do rather than doing two which would also signal a little bit of uncertainty, right? So you want to signal that you're confident that, you're, that you have a strong vision of what you want to do. Okay. Oh, we've, we've definitely had students swap their research idea all once they got the here, time. just yeah. all the time. It's completely natural as you're introduced to new ideas and ways of thinking and perspectives and all, you know, all of that good stuff. It comes in and it helps you cook up a stronger well, idea. When I applied for my PhD, I did the same thing. I mean, and most people, so for mostly, whether it's a PhD or a master's program, the, the, the application part, the research, the statement of research uh, pro, a project, 
is just a way for us to evaluate how you how well you can think and write. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I am interested in Africa, international development, and um, education. So I've just been thinking of how to put everything in one. Fantastic. You know, figure. You know, yeah. It's. I mean, that, that sounds like it's. It's. It would work well with our program. So yeah, just try to figure out how to put that together in a proposal. But don't worry that we're going to hold you to it afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Blossom. Um, let me see. I think that I don't see any other ones. I'll just give you guys a chance. If anybody else here has a question that we haven't answered. Uh, oh, I've got one from the chat, Jason, for you specifically. <laughs> Which students do you think are the best fit for this program and why? Again, you know, what we, <laughs> I think I, I, I sort of, I probably, I kind of answered this before when I, what's the best kind of profile of an applicant. I think that we're looking for somebody who has a strong, strong academic profile, just in the sense that it's difficult to succeed in this program if you're not willing to do a lot of reading, a lot of thinking, and a lot of writing, right? So it is an academic program. It's a heavy academic program. So one, we're going to be looking at people's scores. And the, that's why two of the reference letters are from academics, or hopefully are from academics, right? Um, so that is, I think, a, a big component in, in that. We want to see um, that this person, we look at the writing sample, if again, if I see that the writing sample has a lot of grammatical errors, or the logical flow doesn't work, that's a big red flag for us, right? We want to, because a large part of success in this program is exactly that, writing, thinking, logical skills. And so that's, I think that's strong. As I said before, the fit is a consideration. So if this person's applying to do, you know, solar engineering, that then we're probably gonna say, this is probably not a strong program for you in the sense that we don't have anybody in our faculty who does that. Um, so fit is important. Somebody who's done their research about our program, it's always good. You know, If we see, oh, this person actually has looked through our faculty, has seen what we do, has looked at the structure of the program, maybe even you know, and is able to reference, oh, I'm gonna thinking about doing my extended essays, right? You know, there's students who go out and they apply to 50 different programs and that's absolutely normal because you wanna cast a, a wide net but that also makes it look like it's a bit cookie cutter the way that they apply. So they'll send exactly the same applications to 50 programs. If we see somebody's actually spent the time in researching who we are, that's also, I think, uh, will be make for a stronger uh, application. So those are some of the things that we look at. And then obviously the scores, the scores matter, the English, you know, the GPA and the English scores, that's just basically a way of triaging, a way of saying, okay, we're gonna unfortunately have to exclude a large number of these applicants. And again, it's not, we have bent the rules a little bit in the past based on how compelling the other parts of their application are. So it's not a hard, hard exclusion, but yeah, if you're gonna to need to give us a very strong reason why we need to bend that 3.5 GPA and go a little bit lower, it's hard. We have to then justify it to the university as well. And so that's sort of how we, how we proceed, I guess. Um, and I see that Blossom has, did you, Blossom, did you have another question? Did you put your hand up again? Yes. So. Uh... My academic writing sample is from my undergraduate thesis. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. large. It's about 50 pages or so. Yeah. And I know nobody yeah. has the time to read that long. That's so fine. That's fine. Do you recommend, um, should I pull out some chapters or I should just put it all there? I give you the, the chance to just look at it, scroll to I would, it. I would send the whole thing. I mean, we're obviously not going to read 50 pages, but it, you know, we, we know how to pick and choose. It's again, it's just another way for us assessing how strong is this person academically? Uh, and so I would send us the whole thing. As Bridget said before, there's no minimum or maximum in terms of the writing sample. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I see a question from Mina, but I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean there, dear. Could you, could you please reword it perhaps? Um, other than academics, do you consider their professional experience? Yeah. Like, are you talking about the applicant? Or are you talking about your referees? I'm just not sure. Um, I have a question. It was delivered to me privately, but I'll share it. Uh, does the admission committee evaluate applications on a rolling basis? We are not. We currently are a bit shorthanded to be able to, to be that agile in response to new applications as they come in. We are waiting until the closing date of January 29th, 2023, before turning the records over to the graduate admissions committee for review. So February, late February, early March is when is the earliest you'll be hearing from the program about your acceptance or lack thereof. There's a good question from Sally about uh, language. My thesis is in another language. Do I need to translate it into English? Absolutely. Unfortunately, um, 
we don't we don't have a lot of uh, uh, other languages in the department. Jason is an exception, as a matter of fact. Uh, can flex on a on a couple different ones. But, <laughs> yeah, in but, theory, in theory, it has. To, I mean, no, not in theory. In practice, it has to be in English. Yeah. Yes, it does. Uh, so official documents need to be received in English. So if if you're uh, we, we will need a, an official translation, um, notarized by like a notary public and, and all of that good stuff. I will just, um, I'm trying to find, we don't have any information specifically on our website, but I'll look it up through graduate and postdoctoral studies um, about the, the translation requirement. Kayla has a question about two professors working in Latin America. So that's um, Gerardo and, uh, and Chris. They both work on, on Latin America, so you can check out their website. So their profiles on our webpage, it shows their publications and other stuff. Um, I would add again, you know, we're hard, housed at SFU. It's a massive university. What some of the students currently have done, the, the master's students, is, uh, for example, on their uh, thesis committee, there'll be somebody from outside of our department on the thesis committee, right? They'll, you have a senior supervisor, and then you have a second supervisor. And so one of our students, for example, is very interested in China, and they found a professor in the history department. Um, who works in China, and so that's their second advisor. And so you can do that as well. So there may be two professors here, but there may um, there's many other professors at SFU who work on Latin America. And so I would look at I would look elsewhere in other departments as well. Uh, that could give you a, a fuller a fuller idea. What makes Mina says what I'm asking, other than the academics. So Mina, what I would say is academics is 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 necessary. But there are other things we look at as well. As I said before, for example, we've had students who've been very engaged in activism uh, and they've told us a compelling story. In fact, one of the students who was engaged in activism and pro-democracy activism in a country um, said that, look, I've, been, I've spent my, all of my time over the last four semesters working in these pro-democracy protests, et cetera, et cetera. And that's affected my, some of my academic work. And we'll take that and, and then we would check and we would see this is after this is true. And that's a compelling story. So that, that, for example, is something that we would take into account. Um, uh, you know, if there are experiences that you have outside of the classroom that are relevant to international studies, we'll take that into account. So for example, if you're a great car mechanic, fantastic, but that will probably not have anything to do or help you much. But if, for example, you know, you have, uh, you, you've, you've worked for many years in an NGO working on uh, women's health issues, uh, in Somalia or something like that, then that obvious that very much would would be taken into account. Uh, let's see, uh, we have two more blossom uh, and I think we're going to set ourselves a, a cutoff here for in mm -hmm. five minutes. So uh, I'll go back to blossom. I think you had your hand up first or our own duty. There you go. Go for it. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask, uh, since we have just one page to write the research proposal, uh, should we um, uh, should we mention the methodologies there or the way we are going to conduct the research? Sure, you can do that. Uh, that that would probably I mean I, I would be very brief on it. So you say, for example, that you want to do uh, you know this will be a, a qualitative research based on uh, you know based on interviews uh, or an ethnographic study of this or that, or I'm trying to get a data set of this, and then I'll do quantitative analysis. You know very brief it doesn't have to be extensive you only have a page but yes that would be that definitely would be helpful okay sir uh sir another question is uh, uh i had to repeat one of my graduation year uh, during my bachelor's for medical reasons so i have my bachelor's for four years uh, it should be for three years but i had medical reasons for that i had to repeat one year so should i mention that in my letter of intent or somewhere like, I think, should yeah, should I, I give a justification sure. regarding that? I, you know, you can mention it. It's it's definitely, I don't think it will be, it would definitely not be a problem. But explaining if there's things in your CV or in your transcript that you think should be explained, even if it's just one sentence, then yes, I would put that, I would put that in your application statement. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, I think we're going to wrap up unless there's stuff that, Bridget, are you, are you good? Do we need to do anything else or any other questions? No. I think that's good. We had some really great questions today and ones that I feel like didn't come up last year. So it was, it was extremely valuable. Um, I, yeah. I hope all of you found this uh, enjoyable and valuable as well. Um, we thank you so much for joining us. I'll uh, give one last chance for any um, 
pressing questions, but everything else, of course, can wait. You can email me at intst at sfu.ca. I should also add an asterisk to that. I'm only uh, available through the end of this year as I'm moving on to a new role, um, sort of still with SFU, but but, but not. So I'll, I'll leave it brief, but um, it will be a new graduate program assistant supporting you in the new year. So somebody will be answering that email after Bridget. That would be, yes. that would be somebody else. <laughs> yes. Marie-Claire, you had one last uh, question? Yes, please. Last question. I would like to know what is the acceptance rate for international students? It's just, we don't, I don't think there's a different one. I don't think we disaggregate between domestic and international. And in fact, at the moment, most, I would say about at least two thirds, maybe half or two thirds of our students now are international students. Some of them mm -hmm. are students who, were, who did another degree in Canada and then they moved on to here. But I think at least two, two thirds of them are international students. So as Bridget said, overall, we get close to 200 applications and we accept around 20. And so it's around a 10%, it's maybe 12% sort of acceptance rate in general. And I don't know how to disaggregate that between domestic and international. Okay, sure, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. We're going to try to put this up online. And uh, if you have any other questions, please email us at the address that Bridget gave you. All the best. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all.